Great. Good afternoon and welcome to InfoPoint, Alpha Point's online learning platform. I'm Jesse Traster and with me today is Jake McLaughlin, our Manager of Youth Services. Hello everyone, thanks for joining. Hi Jake. Um, so for the last over 100 years, Alpha Point has been a leader in the education and employment of those with vision loss. And so today's in InfoPoint webinar is on expanded core at home on compensatory skills. So a little bit of housekeeping before we begin. This presentation is designed with accessibility in mind. So if you have no vision, we will be describing slides. For those with low vision, the slides are meant to be accessible. They are a black background with large yellow font. If you are using color inversion software, you may have to turn it off. The key command and Zoom text for this is caps lock C. Across either the top or bottom of your screen, depending on your specific layout with Zoom, is a control bar. You can raise your hand. You can type into the chat box to share information and resources with the participants, um, or you can type in a question, and at the end, we'll have a question and answer portion. Um, if you are not actively using your computer, that control bar may disappear, so you just might need to touch your screen or wiggle your mouse to get that to come up. Our objectives for today's webinar, we want to list the nine areas of the expanded core curriculum. We want to explain the importance of compensatory skills and discuss strategies that you can use at home. So a little bit of background about the expanded core curriculum. Over 80% of learning is visual. That's how our brains are hardwired from birth. So when a child is born with a visual impairment, they have to make up for that main sensory area. That's also how our society is designed, that over 80% of learning is observational or incidental. So we don't set out to teach our students every single thing about the world. A lot of it, they just learn naturally by observing what we're doing. And so those are things that we have to strategically teach our students with visual impairments because they don't have that same ability to learn by observing visually from a distance. It aids in concept development, and we'll be talking a lot about concept development later on in the webinar, but in a nutshell, concept development is sort of your overarching understanding of something. So restaurants as a concept, we know that there are drive-through restaurants, there are sit-down restaurants, some are fast food, some take a while, some require you to dress up in really fancy outfits and use all kinds of utensils that you have to say, okay, which order do I do this? But within that concept of a, those all fall under the broader concept of a restaurant. Um, concepts in particular can be difficult for children who are born with visual impairments. It also helps make education accessible and that's also a big part of the compensatory skills that we'll talk about today is how they can use these skills to access general education curriculum in the classroom. So we have a graphic here from Perkins School for the Blind. You can find it at www.perkins.org slash school slash ECC for expanded core curriculum. And this just explains the expanded core curriculum. So in the center is a gray puzzle piece that says core academics. That's everything that you're learning in the general education classroom. Your reading, writing, arithmetic, uh, social studies, science, PE, all of those things. Around the outside are colorful puzzle pieces. These represent the nine areas of the expanded core that experts in vision loss have identified as things that we specifically have to teach our students so that they can access those core academics. So from the 12 o'clock to 1 o'clock in orange is sensory efficiency. From 1 o'clock to 2 o'clock in yellow is assistive technology. Right at the 3 o'clock is orientation and mobility. Between three and about five-ish is social interaction. At six o'clock in green is self-determination. Between about seven and eight in pink is independent living. At nine o'clock in light blue is recreation and leisure. At between about 10 and 11 in purple is career education. And in between 11 and 12 is compensatory access, which is of course what we'll be discussing today. So Jake, when we are talking about compensatory skills, what do we mean? Sure, Jess, and uh, thanks everybody for joining us today and Jesse, that great introduction as always. And then to get right down to it, um, compensatory skills are the skills that students that are visually impaired or blind need uh, to access all areas of general education and requirements. And those specific 
need skills will change based off of a student's uh, vision or if they have any additional uh, disability. And so there are five areas of these skills. Um, so Jake, can you explain the first one, modes of communication? Yeah. Mm, modes of communication, those are going to include uh, listening, speaking, writing, uh, reading skills, braille, for instance, for instance, but how you're going to uh, uh, communicate verbally and understand that. So your active listening, um, how you're speaking, in what type of format or audience is being uh, engaged with. So if I'm speaking to a professor versus one of my peers, it might be a little bit more formal as a conversation would go versus me just talking to one of my peers and hanging out. So it's all verbal types of communication and listening skills. Then our next one, Jake, is mm -hmm. strategies oh. for accessing printed material. So this is going to encompass uh, large print, uh, braille, uh, audio recordings, having a reader or scribe, someone that's teaching you those types of strategies where normally a sighted individual would just read print. What other types of formatting is there to accommodate the needs for an individual that's visually impaired and blind? All right, our next one is study skills, and these are probably one of the ones that you work with the most because of the college prep program. Sure. Uh, so different types of study skills are going to be very diverse based off of an individual's vision and what they have left, but it's going to really pertain to uh, organizational skills as well. So, you know, where do we place things as far as materials that we need to look back on so that we know where they're at. So this could be highlighting uh, certain materials for individuals that have vision left or placing bump dots on certain uh, pages or locations inside of binders. So you know that, you know, this is where, you know, social studies is kept and how to get there. And even making that, you know, uh, further is, you know, on your laptop, if you're organizing documents and folders, you know, labeling a folder, a new folder as a subject, and then inside that you could have potentially uh, different assignments that you worked on, notes, uh, things like that. And I know that going, that's going into next just is organizational skills, which study skills and organizational skills are very closely linked, and maybe you can give us an idea on that. Uh, so one thing we work with a lot with our adult program is those organizational skills. So labeling strategies, where do I place things? You know, a big one for, especially for people with total vision loss is having a place for everything and that place not moving, which gets a little bit more challenging when you live with people who are sighted, who don't have that same sure. consideration. Um, but just how to label things, organize so that you can easily and efficiently find what you need. Thanks, Jess. And our next one is, I know, big on your agenda, which is going to be concept development, which I hear you talk about all the time. So give us a briefing on that. Uh, so we kind of discussed concepts already, the, you know, kind of with a concept is sort of an overarching, uh, I just lost the word for it, kind of just like that over, that broad category. And within that broad category, you might have smaller categories like a restaurant a vehicle, um, all of those types of things are concepts. And so again, for students, especially with very significant vision loss from birth, who for sighted kids, they form those concepts mostly by observing the world around them, driving down the highway, and they can see all these things outside their windows. They can see all the different trees and how tall they are and their different colors and their leaves. And so they're forming constantly that concept of a tree and the categories within that concept. Our students have to be strategically taught a lot of their concepts because they cannot just observe from a distance the way that a lot of students with typical vision can. So we're going to go ahead and move and Oh, activities, uh, modes of communication. Jess, can you give us some examples and a briefing on what this means and how to engage in this? Absolutely. So you mentioned earlier modes of communication are, I mean, it's what it sounds like. How are you communicating? And this can look a lot of different ways. It could be um, large print, braille, um, sign language, adaptive technology to speak for you if your child has multiple disabilities. So one really 
really good way to build that mode of communication is a book club. Um, if you have neighbor friends who are reading a book, you know, the nice thing, the silver lining to all of this is that we've all become a lot more comfortable with technology and meeting virtually, being able to have your student read a book and discuss it with you or with peers and what they read, what they understood about it. Um, this helps with both the receptive communication, which is the reading, what they're taking in, as well as the expressive, the being able to discuss it. Um, something else that you can do at home is watch documentaries together and again then discuss them. So what is it that you learn from that? And this can help a lot with concept development as well. Um, if you're accessing them on a uh, service such as Netflix, um, newer documentaries might also have descriptive audio. So the nice thing about that is that they'll be describing everything that's in the picture. You just you know, uh, select that as an option under the language options on the video. And so they're building that language, that communication through hearing the description, but they're also learning about different things and then you can discuss them together. Um, I know that there's a lot of good, especially nature themed documentaries for kids that you can find on the various streaming services. Another one, if your student uses sign language, so some of our students who are deaf blind use uh, sign language if they have some vision, they may be able to access sign language from a short distance. Other uh, students may need tactile sign, but if you have a student that is able to at least see some sign language, looking up ASL videos on YouTube. There's lots of fun YouTube channels of people with hearing loss who sign um, two blind brothers or uh, two deaf brothers. I'm sorry. I'm on the is one of my favorites. They uh, there's they have a lot of just kind of fun videos that they can practice re uh, watching that sign and being able to to work on their sign language skills. Um, and if you have a student with multiple disabilities who's using a device, so maybe they have a speaking app on their iPad that they can use to ask for help. So if, they're, if your school, when you guys left, was working on they're asking for a snack, you know, if you have access to that device in the home, um, saying, you know, hey, you know, push the button, show me you want a snack, and then I'll give it to you. So just kind of reinforcing those things as they come up naturally on those modes of communication. So Jesse, the big thing I'm hearing here from you when you're talking about modes of communication, particularly uh, understanding vision loss or blindness is not only are we doing or reading or taking in information, but we're communicating then again with parents or friends about that to start to develop those good communication and active listening skills. Absolutely. Communication is a two-way street. So you'll notice that we have a, I think our next one actually is print access, which is that receptive that I'm taking it in. But that's not the only factor of communication. It's also being able to express yourself. And this is huge when we get into things like self-advocacy and self-determination, topics of two earlier webinars, that we want our students to be able to clearly identify their needs and to be able to advocate for themselves and to be able to uh, interact with their peers. And, and I know, sorry, and then well, as a young, young individual or student, it's good to start getting concept development and modes of communication understood, but it's even more important to get a good early start and foundation on these topics because when we decide it's time for you know transition and we're going into college or we're trying to look for that job uh, you know being able to be able to communicate effectively and clearly and most importantly uh, properly when we go to that interview is crucial in landing that job or you know being in front of professors and understanding and just holding yourself in that position of you know authority almost that I can do this and we'll get it done and you can communicate just like everybody else. And I think that's really important to know is that our students are not any less capable of communication than students with typical vision. Um, the, and the things that we're talking about, those are things that students with typical vision also need. It's just that sometimes um, we need to teach our students with visual impairments a little bit more deliberately than a parent or a teacher of a child with typical vision. Um, as Scott Thornhill likes to say, it's like let you have layers there's a just there's an added layer to vision loss that somebody without vision loss doesn't have and so addressing that layer so that you can um, get the best learning that you can, um, can in the classroom okay next is uh, activities and print access and just 
you know, there's all sorts of different forms of print access on how somebody can communicate, you know, with large font and those different things. But tell us, tell us more about that. So this is a topic really near and dear to my heart as a teacher of the visually impaired. That's how I started my career in vision loss was teaching Braille to students. So this is, I think, my favorite one. Um, but big one for our students with total vision loss or with significant low vision, of course, is Braille. So if you have Braille books, um, I know at one point states had stopped sending out Braille books, but as things are opening back up, we might be able to start getting those if you're ordering them from one of the state repositories. Um, if you have friends that you can do an online book exchange, I know we've seen people in our Parent Connect group say, hey, does any, anybody have Braille books for this age? So just continuing, especially now that we don't have in-person instruction in schools, continuing to get your students hands on braille in some way shape or form something that i really like to have my adults and students do when it's safe and they're out in the community is to read the braille signs because there's almost always mistakes the people who make those signs don't necessarily know braille so you'll walk up to a women's restroom and it'll say something totally different uh, one time i was at a fire department and their janitorial closet and of course in print it said janitor and then braille it said library which was two very different things. So we make a game out of it and I'll tell them if you can find a mistake, come show me and I'll give you a candy bar or something just to kind of get them reading Braille and thinking critically about it. Now, I don't know that I would encourage that during a pandemic touching a whole bunch of stuff that goodness knows how many other people have touched. But as things start to open up, as you start to feel safer, that can be a really fun game to play with your students. And that I think can be very important because our, our print readers, they have so much incidental exposure to print, just driving down the hallway, walking through a store, into a restaurant, they are surrounded by it. But again, with our Braille readers, we have to be a lot more deliberate because they're only encountering it when it's directly under their fingers. So finding those opportunities to get that Braille underneath their fingertips just as much as possible. And Jess, I, I hear the statistic around here all the times related to vision loss and jobs. You know what I'm talking about as far as people? Yes. Uh, okay. So Jake heard this from me. That's why he's grinning. Um, so Ruby Riles did a wonderful study. And what they have found is that Braille is the number one predictor of job success in people with visual impairment. It's not just unemployment, but underemployment that is a real concern when somebody has vision loss. And what they have found is that even for those who can see large print, um, typically when you get to about 24 or 48 point, point font or higher, uh, at that point, it, began, it becomes harder to read at the same rate that somebody who reads typical font reads. And so we have found that even for those people who can read large print, if they at least know some Braille, their chances of employment increase dramatically. And for somebody who's totally blind, that can be um, a major uh, help on the job. And this also gets a little bit into adaptive technology that if they have a refreshable Braille display, which is kind of our next one, if you have access to one that your student was using at school, letting them access websites, letting them read books on that refreshable Braille display. It's the difference between being able to quickly and efficiently find that misplaced comma in a sentence versus having to go character by character with a screen reader. Screen reader is absolutely a wonderful thing and for those who for one reason or another braille is not right for them is a fantastic tool. But if you can use braille it's going to make your life just that much easier. I'm going to chime in real fast, Jess. When we get to the college level <clears throat> and we talk about getting, uh, you know, print access in Brailles or in Braille, 99% of the time, those formats are going to come in electronic documents. You know, we don't really see you know 30 page big you know binders anymore of braille and students carrying those around typically if braille is that students um, preferred uh, means of communication we'll get schedules you know minor kind of documents in braille that they then can go back on and look but books for the uh, main reason now are being you know given an electronic document and then students that prefer Braille are using their refreshable Braille displays to uh, quickly access that material and go through it. And one of the other advantages of Braille um, is that if you think about being in the classroom trying to reference a book, take notes, that type of thing, it's much easier if you've got it under your fingertips versus trying to 
have an earpiece in one ear and listen to your computer, your device, and also listen to the professor. That's still a very doable skill for a lot of students if for one reason or another Braille is not their primary literacy medium. Um, but for those students with Braille, it just, um, it can make college or meetings and that kind of thing where you're having to do a lot of listening to somebody, but you're also trying to take your own notes just a lot easier. So obviously I'm a big fan of Braille, but I might be a little biased because I'm a Braille teacher. <laughs> Absolutely. And well, Jesse, just for that point you're saying, a lot of students will then also record that lecture because there's so much going on that then later they can listen to that recording to see if they missed anything. So, and that's an accommodation that a lot of our students that go through our programs end up getting. Yeah. And most people don't use just one thing. You know, they'll, they might, for somebody who's got some vision, it might be that they use Braille when they're doing something that's longer or more technical, but they use large print for short on the fly things, and they might use auditory uh, when their fingers or their eyes are tired. Most people use a combination, and that's true of sighted people too. You know, sighted people, a lot of people like to listen to audiobooks when they're driving in their car or working in their garden, um, but maybe they want to sit down and read a book. So again, these aren't necessarily things that are different between people with vision loss and without, but maybe we just have to be more deliberate about. Um, and so then talking about print access, of course, the next one is magnification. So if we have, um, if you have a student with low vision who is learning magnifiers in school, if you have access to magnifiers at home and just especially for younger children, just letting them play with them and get used to it. Um, and if you don't have magnifiers at at home, a lot of times you can get one pretty easily from CVS or Walgreens just a real simple two-time magnifier, typically where they have their readers, um, or you can come to the connecting point here at Alpha Point. And when I say come to the connecting point, I really should say call because it's by appointment only due to the pandemic. And we have a wide range of magnifiers if you know what level your student uses and giving them the opportunity to really explore and get comfortable with them. Um, or if they are a large print user, just printing out documents if you have a printer at home in large print um, so they can get used to reading them and large print the nice thing is for a younger student there are no kindergarten books written in 12 point font for our really youngest students those picture books are automatically large print now i can't vouch for how high contrast they are um, but it's really easy to if you once your local libraries reopen to find large print books for younger children for older children it can be a little bit more difficult because it seems like especially in a public library our books go from the what is already a large print font for our younger children to large print is more common in a adult books, but you can sometimes find in the large print section children's books as well. And that's where services like the National Library Service come in. Are there just, are there other types of technical devices that could then enlarge uh, some small print? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, so one thing that we sell at the Connecting Point, which can ship anywhere in the United States, by the way, is our uh, video magnifiers. And so again, your student might have access to one at school. If you're lucky, maybe they got to bring it home with them. Um, but there's some handheld ones that I really like for my older students that have to move from classroom to classroom. They typically have a built-in stand. You put it right on top of the paper you're trying to read. And what's, what I really like about the video magnifiers is that students can control how big or small they make it. They can control the contrast, which for a student who is new to using them, or maybe we see a lot of times around upper elementary, middle school, our students start to become reluctant to use devices. Um, being able to change the contrast and the colors can sometimes be that just little bit of push they need to use the device. Um, a lot of my younger students really like the blue and white contrast, for example. Um, I don't know if they can actually see it better, but they like the color blue and it's what gets them to use the magnifier, so I'll take it. Um, there's desktop versions called CCTVs. And on your computer or your iPhone or your Android phone, there is built-in accessibility. Um, so on the Windows, it's called magnifier. If you go into your control panel and type magnifier, um, you will see that it's not as crisp as Zoom text, but it can get you by in a pinch. For Apple, it's called Zoom, Apple Zoom, and it's a pretty, very robust program. And then your iPhone, your Android, your tablets, they all have different magnification that you can find in settings under accessibility. So those are all way for our large print users to access that large print. 
Thanks for sharing that, Jess. And really, a lot of the college students that are accessing materials this way with using magnifier, some of those handhelds that you're talking about, they look like a tablet or a cell phone. So for somebody that might ne necessarily know what that is, it just is a, another device a student could have to use to do anything. So we are getting a couple of questions that We'll just address real quick the connecting point. I apologize. That's our store here at Alpha Point. We sell all manner of low vision devices or devices for those with total vision loss from magnifiers to talking watches to different types of head worn electronic devices for um, screen reading, magnification. Um, if you name it, we have it and we can ship anywhere. Um, and the PowerPoint itself will not be available, but this will be uh, put on YouTube. Um, and if you uh, if you the, go to alphapoint.org, we do have a sample of like items at Connecting Point online, and we'll have more information about the Connecting Point at the end of the presentation. Um, so another thing is some of our so some of our students don't read Braille or they're still learning Braille. Some of our students don't read large print or they can read it for small periods of time. So a really important skill for all of our students is that auditory. And so that's where reading aloud, even with your older students, having them practice having somebody read to them. Um, because if they're in school and the large print isn't available or their computer breaks or something like that, that may be the, their fallback strategy. So getting them used to stopping and saying, stopping the reader and saying, oh, can you pause for a second? Can you read that last sentence again? Um, I didn't quite hear you or I didn't understand or I need you to go slower. So that advocating skills that all come along with the live reader. Um, and then using a screen reader. So if they, again, if you have an Android or iPhone, if you have um, a computer, Microsoft has narrator, the uh, Apple products have voiceover and then Freedom Scientific. This is a really great one through June 30th. If you go to freedomscientific.com, you can enter in your email address and they are offering free full licenses of Zoom Text or JAWS. Zoom Text is their magnification program. It's the most common one that we see adults in the US use. JAWS is their screen reading program. Again, there's all kinds of screen readers out there. JAWS is by far the most common. And so they actually, you can get those downloads for free. They'll only be free through June 30th. At that point, that license will no longer be valid and you'll go to like a demo version, which typically conks out after about 40 minutes. But it's a great way to get your students exposed to those, uh, those magnification screen reading programs. If you don't have access to those currently, um, you would just need a computer to do it. And then have the students dictate stories to you. So another big one in print access, especially for test taking, is what we call a scribe. So students go to take that end of the year exam that is required at their schools, and especially younger students who are maybe still mastering the Braille code, um, or maybe they're a large print user, but they have trouble with handwriting or typing. They're not there yet. Um, a very common, common accommodation is to have somebody scribe. And so getting them used to being able to say their thoughts out loud so somebody can write them down because the scribe has to write down exactly what they say. And that is really difficult. If you've ever used a dictation on your phone um, instead of typing in, being able to put your thoughts together so that it only says exactly what you want takes some practice. So have students dictate stories to you that you can write down and get them used to that idea of somebody scribing their thoughts. That can be another really fun one that you can do at home. Mad Libs, I love Mad Libs. That can be a great start for that. And these are really important as well, even if you have mastered another form of uh, print access that you like, because here's a perfect example. Whenever we are, a lot of community college will have um, enrollment evaluation exams. And nine times out of 10, when we go in there, the only type of computer that is available um, will have like read or write some basic kind of um, you know accessible software they can use well a student may not have used that software at all before in the past so they're not going to know how to navigate it you know properly appropriately to take that test so we bring in a scribe so that they can then you know take that test accordingly and Schools typically don't allow students to bring in their own laptops or uh, devices during that testing just to, uh, you know, cut down on any type of cheating there might be or using outside sources. So we see scribes even in the college level uh, a lot, if, even if another form of print access or uh, reading medium is preferred. 
Yeah, and again, it's just like people with vision. Um, I'm fully sighted. I find typing on my iPad and iPhone a pain, so I prefer to dictate. So we all in our lives use a variety of auditory print methods. If it's a Braille reader, we throw those in. Um, again, it's just being a little bit more deliberate for our students with vision loss so that they're fully comfortable um, using these when the need may arise. So Jesse likes to tell people what to do, basically. <laughs> just playing. All right, Jake. Okay. All right. Activities. So, Jake, <laughs> so here's another, this is your favorite topic because you feel so much with our college prep students is those study sure. skills. So flashcards, those can be a really difficult one. What are some ways that you make flashcards accessible? So you can make flashcards accessible in a lot of different ways. You can use electronic format even to make flashcards as well and keep those on a you know, PC or laptop uh, just within a Word document. But if we're talking about uh, you know, flashcards in particular, uh, we can put Braille on the outside of those so that students can feel and then you know, the answer on the back. And then pen friends, which are awesome and can be used in a variety of different ways, are, are devices which we can program certain um, labels on uh, cards and then it will then dictate what that label means when you ask it to. This can be used in uh, organizing foods, grocery list, uh, you know, uh, all sorts of different topics pertaining to school. If you have to memorize states and capitals, they're just a great resource and easy to use. Yeah, so the pen friend, that's another thing that we sell in our store, and a lot of our adult clients like it. You have, um, a run, I think it's like a almost kind of a magnetic type of thing, but you have, it looks like a pen, and you have these little circular discs that you can attach. Some of them um, are adhesive, some of them might be on magnets, and when you touch the pen to it, you can record whatever you want that to say, and so then after you've recorded it, every time you touch the pen to that, it will read back whatever you told it, and they are reusable. So if you're making flashcards, uh, you know, when you're done with that particular flashcard, you can just record over to make a new one. Um, so that can be an easy auditory. And then there are all kinds of free online apps. I really like Quizlet um, as one for online flashcards. So sometimes it just takes a little bit more creativity. Um, another one that this is the teacher in me really likes the idea of doing a summer research project. So asking your students, what's something that you want to learn about? Um, and let's go, let's go online. Uh, National Geographic Kids is a really good one that I've used with students who use screen readers and it's decently accessible. Um, there's always gonna be little hiccups along the way, but that one has a lot of really good information. So we've had students say, okay, tell us about a topic that you wanna spend the next month learning about. And being able to practice, not just using the assistive technology, but that's where they can work on those study skills and trying to remember information. And, and that can be a lot of fun learning about something new, but that might just be, maybe it's only fun if you're a teacher. <laughs> No, it's, it's fun and it's, it's good for uh, all students. And this is something that we do during technology camp. We have uh, students uh, pair up in groups and they get to pick um, from a list of 50 different topics on technology, usually pertaining to some type of accessibility feature or software. And then uh, they research it throughout the week. They fill in the uh, uh, curriculum. They even have a rubrics that kind of helps guide them along to make sure that we're getting a good outcome. And then they present that, you know, in front of their peers at the end of the week. So then we're also touching, uh, you know, based on those communication skills, but uh, public speaking as well. So I know that's everybody's favorite thing to do. And the nice thing about Technology Camp, um, it is it is available for rising middle schoolers and high schoolers. And at the end of the week, they get to take that computer home with them, loaded with that software with, I think it's a one-year license, correct, Jake? That is correct, one-year license. Uh, we're trying to get it to where it has both Zoom text and JAWS, but we usually break students up into two main groups based off of if they need screen reader software or magnification. But um, for a lot of our students, you know, progressive vision loss is something that could be happening. So they are, you know, determining right now at their age, well, I'm using magnification, but honestly, I should probably be using JAWS. So we're trying to get it to where we have both of those on there. So a student can learn both as, you know, they develop uh, their skills and move on. There we go. Yeah. Uh
And I, if you haven't yet, um, you can find, I believe, is registration on our website, Jake, for students if they want to register their student for technology camp. Yes, uh, registration is on our website. You'll want to click on Vision Services and then Youth Services, and you can find it. Or you can always email me. Um, you know, after this uh, webinar is over, and I can get you all the information you need to register successfully. And so then another activity along with safe skills is organization skills and again this can be one of the most critical ones uh, so helping the student organize their personal space and this is where you can get really creative i know a lot of us when we first enter the field or we're first working with a child with vision loss there's a sort of fear of what if i do it wrong and one of the things i've discovered working in this field for several years is there is no especially for saying like organizational skills there's no right or wrong so for a student with low vision it might be do they like high contrast. I am an organized by color kind of woman. I have, if you go into my desk drawer in my office, all of the tests that I give during our assessment with comprehensive rehab services are color coded based on if they're an academic test, a, a work assessment, a cognitive test. So some students really like that color coding, you know, different color bins, different color signs, um, large print. You can get, you know, the nice thing is you don't necessarily have to spend money on blindness specific products. I think sometimes that, especially as professionals, we fall into that trap a little bit of, oh, we have to do the blindness specific. But one of my favorite outings that we did or our community-based instruction we did with our adults was we went to the, um, it was the closet. Oh, I'm, I'm losing the name of it. It's a really well-known like California closet or the container, or the container store. That was it. We went to the container store. And we just looked at like, these are all of these different options, like their whole shtick is organization. Um, so thinking about, is it different textures of bins? Is it different colors of bins? Is it things on a specific shelf with a label in braille or using a pen friend? So, and having the student participate in organizing their space. Um, another big organizational one is money folding system. There's lots of different ones out there, but if you Google money folding, um, finding a system that works for your young person, getting them used to handling their own cash, uh, you know, saying like, hey, if we go to the movie theater, you're going to buy your own drinks, I'm going to give you the money, and having them practice that so they get that practice of organizing. Um, of course, again, that's easier said than done during a global pandemic when not everywhere is accepting cash, but <laughs> um, if you're going somewhere that does and you're comfortable with that, that can be another one to practice those organizational skills. Now, Jess, is there any type of technology or apps out there that can help you with uh, organizing your money or understanding the denomination? Yeah, absolutely. So you can, my favorite app is called Seeing, S-E-E-I-N-G, AI for artificial intelligence. It's absolutely free. And I am just amazed at where this technology has gone. So when I started in this field back in 2009, our, our optical character recognition, the software where you take a picture and it reads it to you, um, was still very limited. And now this app can even read handwriting. Now it can't read handwriting like yours, Jake. It has to be pretty neat handwriting, but it can even read handwriting, which would have been unthinkable even 10 years ago. Um, and one of the things it has on there is a denomination reader. So if you have a smartphone or an iPhone, seeing AI is a really good one. Um, you can also apply for a free money reader that you insert the bill into like the edge of the bill, the corner of a bill into this money reader and it tells you the denomination. Another little trick that we teach our uh, low vision clients is if you flip the back of the bill over, there's the denomination on the back of the bill is much larger than it is on the front of the bill. I never realized that until I got into this field, but some of those little tips and tricks for organizing your money um, and getting used to that. And then one thing that we always say is if you are having your student do that, one of their self-advocacy strategies is to tell the person I'm handing you a $20 bill. So that way they know if the person says, oh, you only gave me 10 and that cost $15, that gives them the chance to say, oh, that's not 20, you're handing me a 10, and then I can put that back in my wallet and get out a 20. Um, so that helps with those self-advocacy skills. And asking the person who's giving them change, can you please tell me the denomination of the bill that you're handing me? So again, like we said in previous webinars, expanded core curriculum, none of these, none of these areas are in isolation. You're, they all kind of influence each other. Um, another one are our labeling strategies. So we talked about pen friend, but it doesn't have to be high tech. It can be something as simple as 
on our salt and pepper shakers that our clients use when we're cooking. The salt has a rubber band around it and the pepper doesn't. Um, so all kinds of things like rubber bands. Uh, Jake mentioned bump dots earlier, which are these little, they can be foam, they can be like, some of them are different colors for people who have some vision and just need the color contrast. They can be different shapes. So big little square circle that you can use to label things like the buttons on the microwave, or you can label file folders with them if you have to keep documents for school. So like the square file folder has all of my workplace documents I need when I go through the student transitional employment program. That's how I know where my birth certificate and my social security card are. Um, you know, you can use those. And, and again, it's not too blind and specific. We have something called a spot and line pen. Honestly, I prefer puff paint. I, you know, spot and line pen is great. It's a little bit less messy, but if you don't have a chance to go to a store to get it, or if you like multiple colors, go to Michael's or Joann's or Hobby Lobby or go online and just order yourself some different colored puff paint. That can be another really good labeling strategy. And like you were saying, Jess, it doesn't have to be expensive and more of a are kept inside nowadays so you know being creative in what works for yeah. you is the most important thing and those bump dots the best thing I love about them too is you can put them on the microwave or stove and leave them for however long and then they come right up they don't leave yeah. any type of mess afterwards if you got to get rid of it or sell it or anything or use it for anything else so yeah. they're just really great and friendly they're really cheap too what a packet of of them different kinds is what like 2.99 or something um, I think like a, mul a packet with multiple colors and um, if you're doing the color bump dots or the ones that are the different sizes and shapes if you're doing the tactile only, it, I think the multiple pack is like $7, but it's been a little bit since I've been in the store. But they're, the, the point is they're very cheap. Um, so just, again, don't be afraid to try something and maybe you try something that doesn't work and that's okay and you try something else. I I've seen people use paper clips, rubber bands, hair ties. If you're, if you're like me and you have long hair, you you know those things are all over your house so using those to label again so something like if you've got shampoo and conditioner in the shower put a hair tie around one not around the other and now it's easy to tell which one's the shampoo which one's the conditioner um, i think jesse was trying to make an inside joke because she has a lot of hair and i do not thank you jesse <laughs> you're welcome yeah so there's, again, don't be afraid to be creative and, and let the student get involved. I'm always amazed at what my students come up with on different types of strategies of how they're going to label. I've seen people use different grits of sandpaper to label, you know, just cut up a piece and glue it to the outside of a tub. It's really the sky is the limit on what works for you. And so if you, you can have a lot of fun with it and little side benefit, they might actually clean their room because now they think it's a game. I can't guarantee that that will work, but yeah. it has worked with a couple of my students in the past. <laughs> What's next, Jess? So the last one, of course, is the big one, concept development. So one of my favorite things to do with my students is nature walks and, you know, let them pick up a leaf, a nut, um, an acorn, feel it, let them smell the flowers, just take a field guide with you so that you don't accidentally give them poison ivy. Like I can never tell by looking at it, I always have to check the field guide. But those kinds of things where they're out and they're experiencing nature. And this is one that you can do right now, even though um, we're social distancing because you don't have to get close to other people. So that, that's one of my favorite concept development. And as we're walking, I'll talk about like, oh, I see big trees, I see little trees. And I'll even use really specific language when I say the tree's big. It is like if I put three of you um, standing on each other's shoulders or if I it's twice as big as our house so trying to give them a frame of reference for a totally blind child on what it means when I say that tree is really big or that tree is really small or let them go up and hug the tree and you know Jake you asked me the other day I had a tree cut down you wanted the wood and you said how, how big is it I said oh it'd probably take about three people to get their arms around it yeah that's uh, right <laughs> so giving them that like go up and hug the tree see figure out how how wide it is. This tree is really skinny. I can get your, you can get your arms all the way around it, even though you're only five years old. This tree is really big. We, if we put our arms around together, we still can't touch each other's hands. Oh. And one thing we've done this out at our adventure camps, which are going to take place in July, is we'll go on a nature walk and then we'll collect uh, different leaves, twigs, you know, vines, and then we'll come back and we'll make an actual book out of those and label them. So furthermore, investigating, you know, and developing those skills, you know, as far as uh, these all, all go which is a great way for uh, young people then to look back onto what this is as a reference and a guideline to 
the type of skills you're talking about, Jax. Mm -hmm. Which brings us to our next one, 3D models. Yeah, so this, especially for math and science, um, this can be a really big one. You know, if you're doing geometry and they're talking about cubes and pyramids, if you have blocks or something that they can actually put their hands on, um, because those are what we typically think of as very visual. Science, uh, anything we can put our hands on, um, those are all, anytime you can give somebody 3D, um, whether you make it out of pipe cleaners or you have a block or you go to nature walk because they're learning about different types of leaves and you just grab a whole bunch of leaves, you know, just anytime you can, a student can put their hands on something. And that's true not just for learners with visual impairments, but also for children with full vision as well. Anytime our kids can actually handle something, they're going to get more out of it. And I think, uh, again, just Play-Doh. It's something that we can yes. reuse over and over again to make different shapes, to, uh, you know, describe and then give our students, you know, the chance to make that shape. If we're talking about, uh, you know, geology, what does a mountain look like? Making that mountain. What does a peninsula look like? You know, making that peninsula. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, one of my favorite activities I ever did was when the Lorax movie came out. My students and I made a diorama and we used not just um, all the students had low vision, some of them have very low vision, but so they all had, they could all see a little bit, but we not only used things that were high color and high contrast, but we really played with different textures. So we made trees out of pipe cleaners and pom-pom balls, and we used plastic to represent the water because it has that kind of smooth texture, and it was, and we could talk about the concept that the water is clear. Um, so things like that where you can make that 3D model. Don't be afraid to play around with textures. It, again, the, the students end up thinking it's a lot of fun, and they don't realize they're learning something so it's a win-win um, you know another thing that you can do is with a younger student have them have them participate in cooking the meal with you you can practice those labeling strategies like putting a rubber band around a can so the can of beans has a rubber band around it the can of tomatoes doesn't um, you can get their hands on and they can think about all the different things that go into that meal that helps to develop that overall concept and um, that's a really great one for younger students um, and we'll be talking a lot more about this because next week expanded core curriculum it will be independent living skills and so we'll have a lot more about cooking next week on our webinar series. Um, for older students are uh, getting ready to go through Jake's student transitional employment program have them research jobs. Think about you know start with those entry level jobs for the summer job. We all had that first job that we hated right like my first job was a server. I never want to I worked at a steak and shake. I didn't want to see a, a milkshake again for like the next two years, but it was still a good experience. But you know, all those entry level jobs, maybe it's not your career, but what would you enjoy the most out of all of them? Or maybe what would you dislike the least? And what jobs are you thinking of when you graduate high school? So, um, and Alpha Point can help. So expanding youth experiences. Jake, you want to give us a brief rundown of your I program? Sure. So it's uh, typically monthly community uh, programming where we go out and do all sorts of different activities um, based off of really the expanded core curriculum. We've gone to movies, rock climbing, uh, Nelson Atkins Museum. We've done a lot of different uh, activities. Um, you were breaking up on my end. I don't know if it was my computer or yours, but in case you missed it, basically it's a monthly program with all different activities um, from baseball to art museum to descriptive movies when we're not in the middle of a global pandemic. Um, but if you, subs if you clicked on that button when you registered, subscribe to emails, you'll be getting emails about those expanding youth experiences. We've already talked a lot about the student transitional employment program, that first job. Make sure your student's talking to their vocational rehab counselor about that. We've already mentioned college prep. Again, your student will need to talk to their vocational rehab counselor. We mentioned our tech camp but we also have our adventure camp in July. We have our overnight for our, our older students and our um, day camp for our younger students. And those older students will get to be the counselors for the day camp. So that gives them some leadership experience. And um, we mentioned the connecting point. If you are wanting to order from the connecting point, give Cheryl Rayburn a call, 816 two three seven two zero nine six and she can help you over the phone um, or if you need to set up an appointment at a later date to come into the store to look at things she can help you get that set up as well 
So, and of course we have our Parent Connect Facebook group. If you just go on the Facebook search Alpha Point Parent Connect, you do have to request to join, but uh, as long as you are a parent of a child with vision loss or a vision professional, we'll let you into that group. And that's nice because it's a safe space to share uh, challenges, joys, uh, get ideas from each other, that type of thing. Uh, so we'll go ahead and open it up to questions, but um, while we give people a chance to type, again, we want to say thank you for attending our InfoPoint session today. Um, Alpha Point's mission is to help those with vision loss achieve their dreams and aspirations. If you have vision loss or you know of somebody with vision loss who would benefit from our products or services, please go to www.alpha alphapoint.org. There is an E on the end of Alpha Point. That's also where you can go to donate so we can keep these fabulous programs running. Or you can call our main number 816-421-5848. I know that we've already seen a few questions. Um, so as mentioned earlier, uh, the PowerPoint itself will not be available, but this will be going up on YouTube. We are recording this webinar. And there was a question about, are there more of these? And the answer is yes. So uh, we are in the middle of our expanded core curriculum series. Next week is independent living skills. Um, this will go through uh, the first part of June every Thursday at 2 p.m. Um, and you can find previous webinars on the Alpha Point YouTube channel. Um, and if and for those watching on YouTube later or you don't forget to what is the phrase ring the bell to subscribe to our notifications when the new one pops up. We're still getting used to this whole YouTube thing. So hopefully we got that right. Um, so you'll be able to go and find those there. And on our email list, as we schedule more of our InfoPoint webinars, we will be um, we will be sending those out to you that information. So, what other uh, questions do you all have on compensatory skills? Have you considered um, offering some of your services via an extension service in other areas outside of KC or more rural areas? So the answer to that is yes. Um, my program, which works primarily with working age adults, but we also do work with school students, um, the comprehensive rehab services. Uh, we work through the vocational rehab agencies. And so we have people that come and stay in a residential program to receive training. Um, we've also started doing remote instruction due to COVID-19 and we're hoping that that will be able to continue uh, as once this is over. Um, it just does require that the person have a good internet connection um, for us to be able to work with them. Um, do you teach any of these skills through activities at your camps? Oh, we teach all of them. Yeah. The, the kids think they're there to have fun, but we know that they're there to learn as well. They're, it's, it's a two-way street. They're, they're learning while they're having fun, so hopefully they don't realize that they're learning all of these compensatory skills, all of these different aspects of the expanded core curriculum, but we know the truth. And the biggest part out there is as well, or, you know, they're learning these types of uh, forms of communication, but they're also around a whole bunch of their liked peers. It's one of the first times where they may be around other kids that are visually impaired and blind in large groups. So understanding, you know, how that peer to peer interaction works is crucial. Um, so our camp for the next question is where are these programs located? So most of these programs are here in Kansas City. So our campers meet here at the Alpha Point campus. For tech camp, they stay on campus. For adventure camp, we uh, bus up to Parkville, Missouri, where the camp is. Our expanding youth experiences take place in the community. They're primarily based out of Kansas City, um, but we've gone, I think, well, the furthest we've gone is maybe an hour and a half out for Weston. Yeah, we've gone out to Weston for tubing and snowboarding and skiing. So we did uh, all that this uh, winter, which was a great experience. And then for our residency camp, our overnight adventure camp, we actually have uh, housing out there. So if you guys are living, you know, an hour, an hour and a half away, and it's not, um, you know, convenient for mom or dad or family member to drive you here every day and then pick you up, we have a place for you to stay. And that, that is for uh, kids um, that are, I believe 12 and up. Mm -hmm. So uh, even if you're not from the Kansas City area, your students can certainly come attend any of these services or camps. Um, we've had, uh, we have a local hotel that we work with for our adult clients that come from the state. We've had parents uh, for the day camps, especially the technology camp, choose to stay in that hotel. We have a reduced rate with them um, so their students could attend that technology camp. 
does that pool jesse have a great breakfast and a pool or that hotel <laughs> sorry <laughs> It normally does. Um, they've oh, dude, they've been providing cool. food in room due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The hotel has been just absolutely fantastic about working with us. Um, yeah. Scott has stayed there. He said, yes, there is a great pool. Um, but I think right now that part of the hotel may, may be closed due to the pandemic. Um, but they've been, they've just been wonderful about making sure that they're keeping their guests safe while everything is going on. How far away is that hotel from Apple Point, Jess? Uh, it depends on traffic, about 15 minutes tops. Okay. And it's right there on the Country Club Plaza, so you get to explore uh, the heart of Kansas City. All right, well, if there are no more questions, once again, we want to thank you all for joining us. And don't forget, 2 p.m. next week, we will have expanded core curriculum, independent living skills, learn how to make your, your children cook you breakfast in bed and uh. clean their room. It'll be a lot of fun. <laughs> Oh, it looked like we got one more. Oh, just great job, Jess. Yes. Okay. Hey, and guys, thank you again so much for joining us. Uh, I'll be sending you a survey if you indicated that you would be willing to take one during the registration process. That helps us out a lot to know what topics to talk about and what your areas of interest are. Again, thanks, and we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. So what was going on with my